Uh, so welcome everyone to the second lecture by Professor Alan Hayek at uh, Peking University for the series of online lectures on mathematical philosophy. Uh, I guess by now you all know Professor Hayek and his work to some extent. So I will not repeat his numerous achievements and titles, uh, but just to add a little bit uh, more personal note. <laughs> so actually the, the first uh, work I write, read uh, of uh, Professor Alan Hayek's was actually a draft paper on philosophical uh, heuristics. You know, uh, I think he, at some point you put that draft online and I read it. Uh, and uh, it was really uh, illuminating for me because it's, it's about how actually you do professional philosophy well, in the analytic style. So uh, actually Professor Hayek in that paper uh, present a toolbox that we can use to help us to sort of argue for our points, to illustrate our ideas, and more, uh, most importantly, to find minor or major issues about others <laughs> philosophical theories. And uh, I, I think that's really helpful. And uh, actually in his uh, last uh, previous lecture, you have already seen that uh, he put this kind of uh, um, uh, toolbox into practice. Uh, if you remember, he uh, once mentioned if someone claim uh, there is dx, then you can argue, oh, why it is dx? Why it is so unique? So you can start to, to see whether there is a problem by defining this x or, or related uh, problems. Uh, so I really hope in the future we can invite uh, Professor Hayek to, uh, I mean, physically <laughs> to our universities to uh, say, give a workshop on philosophical writing and how to argue your ideas in philosophy. Um, okay, so today's topic is about uh, the foundation of uh, probability uh, theory, which I think is close to Professor Hayek's heart and also my heart. <laughs> uh, actually, before doing his uh, PhD in philosophy uh, in Princeton, he actually obtained a um, bachelor degree on mathematics and uh, statistics um, as the first degree, and won uh, the prestigious uh, Dreit uh, Prize. Yeah, so the, the title of today's lecture is Omega, uh, the symbol way often used for the sample space in probability theory. And uh, we will see, uh, so what, 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 what should be there in this omega? So what say possible or possibilities we should uh, take into account when we're trying to discuss certain problems? Um, actually, I, I believe we also got similar uh, issues in epistemic modeling. So I'm doing, for example, knowledge, reasoning and stuff. And there we also get a problem. So when building a model, so what, what are the good possibilities to put into your model? So whether you have enough or you have too, min uh, too many or too few. So I think it's very uh, fascinating uh, to us also to the general uh, audience on probability theory. So, yeah. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's welcome Professor Hayek. Thank you so much, Yanjing Xiexie. Uh, again, it's a, a delight to, to be with you. And again, let me express my regret that I can't be there in person with you, but one day I would love to see you and it will happen, I'm sure. And, and thank you also, Yanjing, for mentioning my heuristics project. And actually, it's good that you said that I will insert a little bit uh, just a teaser of, of that project into this very talk. So, so you will get some sense of that other project of mine today, but, but I have much, much more to say about that for another occasion. All right, Omega, the shortest title that a talk could have, but it's the ultimate object in probability theory. All right, well, let's start talking about my favorite topic, me. Uh, I've long been worried about problems in the foundations of probability. And Yanjing actually mentioned my background in probability theory. I used to uh, go
go to lectures on probability statistics and my professors would teach me lots of nice theorems about probability and they would write on the board this was back in the days when we had blackboards you know p of this equals p of that and i would say excuse me what is p what does p mean and they looked at me like i needed medication and said you'd better go to the philosophy department anyway eventually i did anyway i've long been worried about questions like that problems in the foundations of probability now this this omega project this is the first part of a much larger project that i want to undertake forecasting extreme events estimating as well as we can the probabilities of high stakes events that we think are improbable think for example of uh, human extinction climate change by the end of the century or you know another pandemic maybe much bigger than the one we're in at the moment what are the probabilities of such events high stakes hopefully relatively low probabilities well we need to see we need to figure them out i think that the first crucial step to take is to come up with a sample space omega but I'll argue that there are problems, however we go about doing this, thought of both as a theoretical problem and as a practical problem. I'll offer some desiderata for the choice of omega and some heuristics for generating possibilities to include in omega. And this is where my heuristics project comes in, which Yanjing mentioned. And I'll raise some concerns about the modeling of omega of an ideal agent and also agents like us, I will end with a, an omega dilemma. All right, well, enough about me. Let's talk about me and omega. <laughs> the fundamental notion of probability theory is that of a probability space, and it's a triple omega FP. Omega is a non empty set, the sample space. F is a set of subsets of omega. P is a probability function, and I ask my professors, what is this P? What does probability mean? But now let's talk about omega. Now, almost all of the 360 plus year history of probability and philosophy of probability has focused on P, its axiomatization. For example, Kolmogorov's axiomatization is standard, its theorems you know, whatever, Bayes' theorem and so on. Its interpretation, you know, is P, and this was the question I asked my professors really, is P degree of belief or is it frequency or is it some logical evidential notion or is it propensity, objective chance in the world? What is P? Well, I worried about that for a long time. Now I'm worried about omega and you should be too. We usually think of interpretations of probability is concerning only P. But omega is part of P's formalism and it's just an uninterpreted set. Omega. Well, how should we interpret it? A set of what? There are also problems with the formalism itself regarding omega, as we'll see. Now, this is a relatively new area for me. And indeed, I think it's a relatively new area period. As I say, people have long been talking about P, but they've said very little about omega. But the more I think about it, the more important it seems to me. It has ramifications for probability theory, statistics, decision theory, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, scientific modeling, modeling ideal agents as we find in formal epistemology, and Yanjing mentioned something to do with epistemology too, real life applications, and so on. Well, I'll try to say some things that I hope also will be of practical use, but being a philosopher, I won't be able to stop myself from saying some more philosophical and purely theoretical things. And perhaps some of them will indirectly yield something practical as well. All right, enough about me and Omega. Let's talk about, well, Omega itself with some preliminaries. Why Omega? Omega is the final Greek letter. The dictionary defines Omega as the extreme or final part. 
And we're told that omega is the ultimate set of possible outcomes. But often in practice, omega is not that. It may be provisional, subject to revision. At best, it is ultimate for now. Well, it's the final Greek letter, but it's, it comes before P. And as such, it's consistent with other approaches to uncertainty. Actually, I can't help but make a little almost joke that uh, there's a nice orthographic accident, at least on English uh, keyboards, typewriters. Omega corresponds on our keyboard to the letter W. And W is evocative of worlds, which is how philosophers like to talk. So this is a, like a, a happy accident, but often omega is not that either. And I'll say more about other things that it could be. All right. Well, when I say that it's the final Greek letter, it comes before P, we need omega before we can define P. We like to speak of an agent's prior probability function, but omega is prior to the prior. It's, it's really where probability theory starts. But it doesn't have to be probability theory because omega is consistent with other approaches to uncertainty like dempster schafer theory or comparative probability, qualitative probability, ranking functions, info gap, you know, different approaches to uncertainty. Now calling omega the sample space as everybody does is a little odd. Every probability statistics textbook teaches you omega is the sample space. But sampling is a notion from statistical inference, and it's just irrelevant to many omega. Look, when we represent your uncertainty about how this coin toss will land, we don't need any sample. And there certainly isn't any sample for your prior probability function, like before you gathered any evidence at all. Uh, by the way, I've, I have another project, so many things to tell you about, so little time. This other project is called malaprobisms. Uh, that's a play on words. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. Uh, malapropisms in English. Uh, th these are sort of, you know, misuses of, of words. And I want to write a whole paper about all of the misused terminology in probability theory and the philosophy of probability. You know, words like, uh, well, sample space, uh, expectation, uh, random sample, uh, um, random variable, posterior, prior, likelihood. There are so many words that we use in this line of work that I just think are misleading. And so I want to write a whole paper about that. But anyway, I've said enough about omega being misleading. For example, probability space, sorry, possibility space would be better. It's a space of possibilities. Omega is a non-empty set. That's the first thing we're told. And often that's all we're told about omega. Well, that's already a theoretical commitment. Right there, omega is not a vector. It's not a multiset. It's not a topos, not a category, not a causal graph, nor any other kind of abstract object. It's a set. And uh, importantly, it's not a proper class. And I'll say more about that later. Well, a set, a set of what? Possibilities or outcomes, but which? Now the answer will depend on our inter interpretation of P, subjective or objective. And this is where actually the philosophy of omega interacts with the philosophy of P. That's the question that I used to ask my professors. I'll be concerned here with subjective probability. So it's agents like us perhaps, or perhaps ideal. All right, let's go. Omega statistic probability. At a first stab, omega's possibilities are the objects of an agent's uncertainty, which we want to regiment. Alan, sorry, way. sorry, sorry for the interruption. So maybe, uh, 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 maybe your notes are on your microphone. 
So oh, would, I see. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you please uh, move your nose uh, a, a bit far from the microphone because uh, yeah, every time we turn the page, there will be <laughs> noise. So yeah. oh, I see. Okay, good yeah, to know. Yeah. I will. I will try yeah, to just just that. put it. Uh, uh, yeah, somewhere. That's a good idea. How's yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, Sorry. no. Thank you. I, it's, I, and and keep doing it if I <laughs> make other mistakes. All right. So we want to regiment the possibilities. They will depend on whether we're thinking practically or theoretically. When we use philosophers and mathematics theoretically. Now, anyway, I just got a little. Okay, do you hear me? All good? Do you hear me? Yeah, good. Okay, great. Uh, I, I got this disturbing sign saying there was something wrong with my internet connection. All right. Oh, right. Now it's fine. That's yeah. good. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Funny. And uh, oh, yeah, the, the perils of high tech presentations. Now, typical examples you toss a coin once. The outcomes are heads and tails, right? Two, three, four, five, six, right? We'll see. The possibilities that I just gave you, they're not jointly exhaustive. They do not form a partition. The coin could land, for example, on its edge. I just saw a good YouTube video of a, a young guy tossing a coin and and literally one one toss the coin lands on its edge and i guess they say the probability of that is about one in six thousand it's worth seeing on the youtube video anyway right there's proof that uh heads tails does not exhaust the possibilities similarly for one through six well we get trained up in probability theory with toy examples like these. Now, we could have extended the sets, as I will say, sideways with more possibilities, which are also mutually exclusive from what we said. For example, heads, tails, edge. Okay, so imagine I'm writing it down, heads, tails, and now I go sideways. There's another possibility that I didn't mention before edge and it's mutually exclusive from the others okay or the die one through six but hang on there's another possibility that a tornado could carry the die away before it lands okay so it's an idealization to neglect such possibilities so as i say we could have extended the sets sideways with more mutually exclusive possibilities now, it's especially hard to come up with an exhaustive list of specific possibilities in a high uncertainty situation. So these are they're not representative. Hi, Alan. Uh, can you hear me? Um, there seems uh, some network problem again. So can you hear me? We get the comp yeah, I, yes, I can. Yeah, no, now it's better. So it works, better. yeah, a little bit. So tell you what, if there's another, any more problems, I will move to another room. Uh, it's, it's funny, this is exactly where I sat last Friday and it was good. And <laughs> there must be something about some server or, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So no, there is, a, yeah, some probability that you try exactly the same thing, but it doesn't work like that. So, <laughs> yeah. If you if 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 it fails, we signal, and I'll move. To another. Yeah, it's I, I think you can try another room. <laughs> um, 
hang in there for about 30 seconds. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, that's not. Mm. Okay. Okay, well, I've definitely used this room successfully in the past. I hope it's okay now. How's. Yeah, how's yeah, it, it's working. It, that's it's good, right? perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> should, be, should be good. Let's, let's, let's try for this. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Hmm. Uh, okay, we were up to just my imagining various crazy things that could happen, like the die being carried away by a tornado. <laughs> And I said that we got lulled into a false sense of security, complacency by the tales and so on. Just think of this, like, tell me all the ways that China's, I think you can hear me, right? So uh, there is still a little bit of problem. So um, let's see uh, if you continue. Let, let, let's see whether it works. Crazy. This, yeah. Yeah, but uh, this is exactly a, a very good example for your talk. I mean, the, we didn't consider this possibility in our Omega. <laughs> we yeah, tried exactly. exactly the same thing, right? <laughs> we we just exclude this possibility that you tried everything the same, but it didn't. Maybe I mean, that works. I, High uncertainty situations. What what can you do? And uh, uh, okay, now for the third time, I'll attempt to. Yeah, good, you got me. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Please. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's for, for the third time, I will attempt to make my point about uh, in real life how omega could be much much harder to pin down. So my example was uh, think of all the ways that China's crops could be endangered. Okay, please tell me omega for that. I, I would hardly know where, where to start, and I certainly wouldn't know where to finish. Now, also, the possibilities are not maximally specific. So think again of heads and tax grant propositions. We did not subdivide them, for example, into all of the various directions that the head could be oriented. By the way, for on on your coins, Chinese coins, I can't remember. Do you literally have heads? Do you have a person's face on one side? No, no. I think we have a number on one side and the other side is uh, either the, uh, the the Chinese logo or, or, or some flower or something. So we don't have head. But you also don't have the tails. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> That's a very, that's a very good point. I, I, I once gave uh, you know a version of this talk in in Japan, and I was talking about heads and tails, and they didn't know what I was talking about. And I, and then I said, well, well, well come on. So I, I, I pulled out one of their Japanese coins, and I said, well, look, see, so you got a coin, and on one side you've got, hang on, a building, and on the other side you've got a flower. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, anyway, you, you know what I'm talking about, I yeah. think. I, it, 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 I hope that the case uh, still works. All right, so just think of all the ways that the heads could be oriented, you know, angle from north. I didn't tell you anything about that. I could have fine-grained heads, tails accordingly. Let alone, uh, let alone all of the independent, irrelevant things I could have conjoined to heads and tails. For example, heads and it's raining in Moscow. Heads and it's snowing in Moscow. I, I didn't tell you anything about that in my Omega. So we could have extended what I'll say downwards. We could have extended the sets downwards with refinements, more refinements of the possibilities that we've identified. 
And let's draw a picture of that. So we started with heads, tails, and then going sideways, we could have extended it to heads, tails, edge, and I could have added, uh, you know, whatever, a bird flies away with the coin and so on. As I said, that's what I'll call omega being sideways incomplete when we can still add mutually exclusive alternatives. Now let's extend downwards. I could have opened up these possibilities. Heads could be heads and raining in Moscow, heads and not raining in Moscow, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And I could keep on refining and refining. I'm never finished in that direction. You could call this downwards incompleteness. And that's our typical situation, incompleteness both sideways and downwards. Adding alternatives sideways to a given possibility raises the question of whether it will occur. Refining possibilities downwards raises the question of how it will occur. Now, our omega will typically be incomplete both sideways and downwards. The possibilities are not jointly ex exhaustive and they're not maximally specific. Again, heads, tails, one through six. And these two directions are just independent of each other. Omega could be complete in both directions or in one direction sideways or just, just one direction downwards or in neither direction. And that's the most typical. And sideways and downwards incompleteness will figure centrally in my omega dilemma at the end. And, and notice I'm trying to build up a bit of suspense about this omega dilemma. A few, at a few points, I'm gonna say, hey, we've got a big problem coming at the end. Now, so here are some reasons to stop. Uh, yeah, there it is. Here are some reasons to stop extending sideways. Well, we're practically certain of the possibilities we already have whatever that means. We sometimes speak of practical certainty. That actually could use a bit of philosophical analysis, I think. Or we just haven't thought of any others. Maybe we're not very imaginative, for example. Or we don't care about any others. Or just think of real life. We're short of time or of imagination. We have to work with what we've thought of. Or this, this is a real case that my friends in agriculture, the agricultural department tell me, some possibilities might be too politically sensitive. You don't want to mention them. Okay, reasons to stop extending downwards as before, but also we can't discriminate among the refinements. We wouldn't know which one was real, realized. Well, look, at some point we have to just decide to stop our construction of Omega. Well, when, when should that happen? Well, the proper stopping point is itself a decision problem. But ironically, we use Bayesian decision theory to solve decision problems. But that theory presupposes that we have a probability space. Here, the decision problem is, which probability space should we have? Do we solve that by two probability spaces? Which? And we may be uncertain captured all possible to us. But how do we anyway that want all right? So there are two operations formation and revision. We construct an initial omega, which we may later revise. So this is a bit like the prior and updating the posterior on the probability side. But unlike probabilities, one can rationally revise omega without any evidence or learning. For example, because one's practical interests have changed or the context has changed. Remember, there was no constraint on omega in the first place. It was just a set. Or on the basis of evidence or learning, we might undergo a conceptual change or even a scientific revolution in which we need to represent new possibilities. 
Bayesianism has a hard time representing this. There are no, there's no structural guidance for the initial choice of omega the way there is for P. So in the case of P, we, we're told thou shalt obey the following axioms. You know, non-negativity, normalization, additivity, or further constraints like, you know, don't assign probability zero to anything unless it's impossible. And then there are various arguments for obeying these axioms, Dutch book or accuracy arguments. This is a big industry these days, calibration and so on. But there's no analog for the choice of omega. Uh, sorry, I should have hit the slide for all of this. Uh, and there's no substantive guidance for choosing omega either. There's no analog of, let's say, the principle of indifference or the principle principle, which constrain P. They constrain the probabilities themselves. Not so for omega. We just, we're on our own, right? Now that's good news and bad news. Good. There's no such thing as an irrational choice of omega by the lights of probability theory. Bad. There's no guidance for choosing well. And notice how the identity of omega is intimately connected to arguments and presuppose it. So I talked about these things. Alan, if you I, I think we can all hear you again now. Uh, can you hear us? Actually, time this has happened to me. So let me. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it seems it's. I mean, the the quality of the network is. Uh, well. Yeah. Oscillating. Yeah. Maybe. Some... I don't know, maybe it's the time of day or something. Uh, I don't know if that makes a difference yeah, because yeah, uh, I've ne never had a problem before. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can, yeah, should I yeah. now, now it's, it's again back to normal. It's crazy. And I, I'm, I'm not sure I can do it any better than, than this because uh -huh. uh, I understand. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I could go to some worse places, but uh, <laughs> probably not better places. Wow. Yeah, but currently it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and thank you. Stop me and I can repeat <laughs> things if need be. Uh, yeah, you know, here we are. This is the this is the, the Zoom era. This is <laughs> this is the, the, what our lives are like these days. All right. Uh, again, I was saying how the Dutch book arguments and so on. They have the following form: if you violate a norm, you know, for example, probability axioms, you are subject to something bad, like sure loss in every possibility, you know, come what may, you will suffer, okay? Well, what does come what may mean? And what does every possibility mean? Or again, do it for the accuracy argument. You know, if you don't obey the probability calculus in your credences, then you are accuracy dominated. You know, there's another probability function that's at least as close to the truth as yours in every possibility. But hang on, what are the possibilities? So do you see how the two are connected? The set of possibilities, which are omega, and these arguments for P having certain properties and so on. What are these possibilities? Again, you know, so these arguments depend on us knowing, but there's a sense in which we haven't sorted that out. The print for an evidence equal probability. Hi. 
Alan. Gilaris, you fix his. Alan, are we back? So, I, I, sorry, yeah. sorry. We, we missed the first um, part, the first item on this slide. I, I think there is one thing we, we can try. So, yeah. would you please turn off your video? Uh -huh. Maybe that, yeah. that helps. Yeah. I will help you to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, let, let's try it. Maybe maybe it helps a little bit. I mean, I already turned off your idea. So you, you just uh, you restart uh, the thing. Yep. Uh, and yeah, I think it, it may help. That, I think that's a great idea. And uh -huh. are we still good on the slides? You can see the slides. Yes. I can keep yes. talking. Yes, everything is okay. good. Yeah, very yeah, nice. Let's, yeah. Okay. We were up to regularity. Uh, and, and again, interrupt me, please. Thank you. It's very helpful yeah. if, if yeah. there's a there's still a problem, but I, I think we're good. If X is a non-empty set of possibilities, then the probability of X is positive. That's called regularity. It's not a very <laughs> mnemonic name. I would call it something like, you know, being undogmatic, you're being open-minded. But again, what are the possibilities? And so it goes. I, I think you see the point I'm making. Let's let's do it for the principal principle that's stated in terms of any reasonable initial credence function. That's how Lewis stated it. And one constraint he said on such a function is it's regular. But again, that is to, defined in terms of possibilities. What are the possibilities? All right, similarly, there's no guidance for the revision of omega. There's no revision rule when it comes to omega. On the contrary, Bayesianism typically assumes omega is fixed throughout. Now that's a nice idealization perhaps, but it's far from realistic. Indeed, the standard arguments for revision rules such as conditionalization, imaging, minimum distance, etc., they all assume a fixed omega. For example, how do you even measure the distance between two probability functions that have different domains? You know, one omega for one, different omega for another. Okay, so we're on our own. We just have to choose, choose an omega and let's hope we choose well, fingers crossed. Well, I think we can do better. We can lay down some guidelines for desirable features of omega and some heuristics for coming up with an omega that has those features and for an improving an omega that we have. Now, uh, because of time limitations, I can't go deeply into my heuristics project and Yenjing mentioned, mentioned them at the very beginning, but just, just quickly. So I have this big project on the side, philosophical heuristics, identifying and studying various techniques that philosophers repeatedly use, often unconsciously and I repurpose them to help us construct an omega. So just to give you a sense of that, here's a good problem, how to argue that X is possible. There are many ways to argue that X is possible. This is something philosophers love to do. They like to argue that, you know, zombies are possible or that, you know, it's, it's possible to know all of the physical facts but not know what the color red looks like, okay? Or, you know, the Chinese room is possible, says Searle, or what, what have you. Okay, how do you show that something's possible? Here's a quick survey. There are two main forms of argument. First, begin with some other suitable property that X has and infer that X is possible. So what are some candidates for that? X is actually true. <laughs> That's a good way to show that it's possible. It's actual. X has positive probability. Or better still, to allow for irregularity, X is more probable than a contradiction. X is conceivable. Dave Chalmers loves this one. Zombies are conceivable, so they're possible, that sort of thing. X corresponds to a point in a phase space that one of our best scientific theories countenances. Not X is arbitrary. Lewis likes that one. Not X is unprovable. That's a syntactic method. 
x has the form v and not w, where there is an inference barrier between v and w. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a whole literature on this. Uh, according to a, an inference barrier, one cannot derive sentences of one kind from sentences of another. For example, no ought from an is. That's, that says that there's an inference barrier. You can't validly derive from is claims, ought claims. Claims about the past and the future. According to Hume, this is his famous problem of induction. There's an inference barrier there. Claims about what actually happens and probability claims, I think. I think there, you don't have reductions that would uh, allow this derivation. Okay, let's move on to the next kind of technique. Begin with something else, let's call it Y, that is suitably related to X and possible, we know that. And infer that X is possible too, or perhaps two or more things, call them Y and Z, okay? So first we look elsewhere from X, we know that something else is possible and suitably related to X, and then we derive that X is possible. So let me give you some examples of that. Y entails X where Y is possible, okay? So if you can somehow establish that Y is possible, then you're, you're good to go for X. Y is compatible with X. Almost X is possible. I like this one. Uh, so start with something that's very close to X. It's possible derive that X is possible too. Uh, look, I'll give you just a quick example of that. According to behaviorism about the mind, according to behaviorism, it is not possible to have a rich mental life and no behavioral manifestation of it whatsoever, okay? If you have no behavioral manifestation at all, then the lights are off. There is just no mental uh, goings on. That is just false. Behaviorism is wrong because it is possible to have a rich mental life and no behavioral manifestation of it. How do I convince you of that? Well, think of someone who has almost no behavioral manifestation. Think of Stephen Hawking who's sadly no longer with us. But remember, he, he could just barely move one finger, right? He, he could hardly move at all. But please don't tell me that he had no mental life whatsoever. That, obviously, that's true and, and, and kind of offensive, actually. Okay, so now imagine Stephen Hawking just losing that last bit of finger movement. It's not like suddenly his mental life will disappear. Okay, so... Uh, that's an example of this form of argument. What about extrapolation? You have a sequence of cases that are possible and then you extrapolate them. X lies just beyond, so you say X is possible too. Or interpolation, you've got cases on either side of X, each possible, so you interpolate, X itself is possible. Combinatorialism, take things that are separately possible and put them together in any arrangement permitted by shape and size. So according to combinatorialism, the result is possible. For example, it's possible for a pub to sit on top of Mount Everest because we have Mount Everest, that's possible. It's actual. You've got a pub, you put the two together. Various physical transformations, rotation, translation, contraction, dilation, charge conjugation, parity transformation, time reversal, okay, physics is full of these. Start with something that's possible, apply one of these transformations, the result is possible too, according to physics. All right. Well, what should omega be? In one sense, the best possible omega would have exactly one possibility at the level of refinement that we care about. The actual possibility, the way things actually turn out at that level. I'm slightly joking, but I'm imagining it would be great if God could tell us 
use this omega. For example, in the coin toss, heads. And that's it. Trust me, the coin's going to land heads. That's all you need to know. Okay, great. There's my omega problem solved. I know the outcome, heads. <laughs> the trouble is, that's not our circumstance. We don't know the actual outcome in the cases of interest to us. If we did, we would not be assigning probabilities. This would not represent our uncertainty. A necessary condition on a good omega, the actual outcome is in it. Exactly of one of, one of omega's possibilities is realized. We don't want to be caught by what, what we call black swans. These are unforeseen possibilities. Like remember the global financial crisis, that was a black swan economically. And this will be crucial later on. But that puts pressure on us to expand omega. A natural thought is that it should be the set of all epistemic possibilities for a given agent. But what is an epistemic possibility for an agent? Even that is a somewhat uh, elusive notion. Now we could understand that various ways. For example, P is epistemically possible for the agent if and only if P is compatible with what she knows, or she does not know that not P, or she should not be certain that not P, and, and so on. Is another necessary condition on a good omega that it not contain, not include, epistemic impossibilities, possibilities that the agent has ruled out. Okay, so you might think, well, a good omega shouldn't include things that you know are not the case. But I think that's wrong. Maybe she's interested in counterfactuals about what would be the case if such and such a possibility were to happen. And it seems that we can have conditional probabilities that are defined even when the condition is epistemically impossible. Well, since conditional probability is normally defined on a Cartesian product of subsets of omega, it seems that omega for conditional probability should be larger than just the collection of epistemic possibilities. But it's normally assumed that the omegas for conditional probability and unconditional probability are the same. I question that. Perhaps then omega should be the collection of worlds that needn't be epistemically possible, but that are merely entertainable by an agent. Well, given that agents like us can't entertain an entire world with all its detail, perhaps better still, Omega should be the collection of maximally fine-grained entertainable propositions. But still, there's an issue. Entertainable is a modal notion. What's the operative modality? What set of possibilities does it generate? Do, do you see how this problem just never seems to go away? All right, well, what about omega for ideal agents? Philosophers often talk about expanding omega all the way to the set of all possible worlds, especially when they're modeling ideal agents. I think David Lewis, for example, talks like this quite a lot. Here we leave behind practical considerations. Now we're speaking entirely theoretically. Then it sounds like omega is chosen for us, so to speak. <laughs> no wonder we're given no guidance on choosing it. And no, no wonder we're given no guidance on revising it. It's fixed once and for all. It's just the set of all possible worlds. And they are what they are. Well, understood this way, the foundation of subjective Bayesianism is the same for all subjects and thus seems to be entirely objective. You know, it's just a fact of the matter of what the possible worlds are. Well, a fixed, that may seem a little odd. Why aren't the possibilities those over which a given agent is uncertain as she represents them, a subjective omega? A fixed omega seems reasonable for an objective probability function, for example, the chance function, but less so for a subjective probability function. So yet again, I'm, I'm trying to make the point of how omega and P 
interact. But anyway, I'm skeptical about there being such a thing as the set of all possible worlds, even though philosophers keep saying it. Uh, for those of you who know Kaplan's paradox, that's one reason Lewis talks, talks about that. But here, here's my argument why there are just too many possibilities to form a set, too many possible worlds. For each cardinal number k, it could be an epistemic possibility for an agent that there are k dogs, okay? You know, there could be <laughs> one dog, there could be two dogs, there could be Aleph naught dogs, there could be Aleph one dogs and so on. But then we have a proper class, many such possibilities because there are proper class, many cardinal numbers. We have a proper class sized omega, <laughs> OMG. Well, then we need a new kind of probability theory one that begins with proper classes rather than sets. But that seems like big news to me. For example, what are we to make of the sigma algebra F? It's supposed to be a set of subsets of omega that has omega as a member to which probabilities attach. But if omega is a proper class, it cannot be a member of anything. So it cannot be a member of F. What then do probabilities attach to? We need to revise this whole basic theory of probability. All right, so if omega is constituted by all possible worlds, then it's sideways complete, but it is a proper class rather than a set we need to rethink the mathematics of probability theory. This omega is not downwards complete. Uh, now you might've thought, well, gee, come on, Alan, the, the set of all possible worlds that's downward complete, namely the possibilities are as fine grained as they could be. No, that's wrong. We could further refine the possible worlds into centered possible worlds, which mark a designated time and individual. Then and only then is omega both sideways and downwards complete. But this only exacerbates the cardinality worries. A given world now corresponds to many centered worlds. <laughs> there, there are K dogs and I'm this person at this time. All right, finally, this brings me to the first horn of the Omega Dilemma. I'm ho I hope you're feeling the suspense. I'm sort of building up to this final dilemma. If Omega is sideways and downwards complete, then it is a proper class. Then orthodox probability theory breaks down and must be rethought. So it's not the good old days of Kolmogorov anymore. <laughs> In any case, worlds and even more so centered worlds are too fine grained for our practical purposes. They're unnecessarily and intractably detailed. And this brings us to Omega for agents more like us. Uh, and I'm just going to stop myself and, and do a little check. Are you still with me? I, I can't uh, tell whether you're hearing me and uh, is it all good? Yes, yes, yes. We're all listening. So please, please go off. That's great. Don't worry. Yeah, I'll let you know if there is something wrong. Good, good, yeah. good time. My, I guess my, my worry is if things went really badly, you couldn't even let me know. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but you, you will see some uh, error message on Zoom. Yeah, maybe that's right. I, yeah, I just worry. envisioned myself talking and talking, you know. For... Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody yeah. hears anything. Thank you. It was reassuring that you're still there. So let's talk about Omega for agents more like us. We're pulled in opposite directions at the level of grain that we care about in our practical concerns, a small om omega is more tractable, easier to work with, but more likely to miss the actual outcome. At one extreme, we have omega is just the actual outcome, but we don't know when we have it. At the other extreme, we have omega is the class of all possible worlds, or even the class of all centered possible worlds, <laughs> completely intractable, 
Our practical situation is somewhere between. In practice, Omega should include the possibilities that we care about, but not ones that we don't care about. It should find the sweet spot of being inclusive, but not too inclusive. All right, here's a rule for when you should refine Omega. Do so whenever you have a preference between two different realizations of a given possibility. For example, if, if heads and rain in Moscow has a different payoff for you than heads and no rain in Moscow, well, then you should distinguish them. Every utility should have a bearer. And better still, refine Omega whenever it's an epistemic possibility for you that you have such a preference or will have such a preference. Uh, maybe you don't, or maybe you don't now, but you could have. So our representation of uncertainty, our doxastic state, is to this extent bound up with our values, our desires, our bouletic state. I like to drop that fancy word. And indeed, to some extent, the latter dictates the former. You know, our values dictate our representation of uncertainty. In practice, I think it's best to overstock Omega first so that the possibilities are in there to assess their value. We can later cull them if they make distinctions that don't matter to us. We enumerate some possibilities, but they run out before they exhaust all of logical space, or we run out of them because we're exhausted. Again, think of heads, tails, edge, and we could, we could extend that, or maybe heads, tails, edge, bird flies away with the coin. But we can't just leave the ellipsis dots. We don't have a rule to how to continue the list indefinitely. So we might stop with the list that we have and hope for the best. Then Omega is sideways incomplete. We might think of our probabilities as being conditional on one of the, the outcomes that we have enumerated having occurred. But what if something not on that list happens? Remember the black swans I mentioned before? Our conditional probabilities are undefined on such outcomes. How should we revise in that case? You know, bang, a financial crisis happened. You weren't expecting it. Come on, revise. If Omega is sideways incomplete, then we have no account of how to update our credences and utilities when we encounter black swans unforeseen possibilities. <laughs> Maybe it's a black swan that flies away with the coin. We are unprepared for surprises. Okay, and now we're getting pretty much to the last part of the talk. There's a popular way to sideways complete omegas. Catch-alls. Well, in various real life problems rather than artificial gambling problems, we often include a catch all possibility that we cannot characterize positively. We say something like none of these possibilities, the ones that we do characterize positively. We say things like none of the above, other, something else. For example, heads, tails, edge, bird flies away with the coin, catch all, you know, anything else that could happen. An omega with a catch all is always sideways complete, but it is downwards incomplete. Catch all has no internal structure and it does not distinguish many different possible outcomes. Sometimes an event of greatest interest to us resides there, for example, black swans. We may be able to refine the catch-all, discerning various more specific possibilities contained within it. For example, heads, tails, edge, bird flies away with the coin, dog runs away with the coin. I, I have a couple of dogs. Uh, I'm glad they've been well behaved during this talk. Okay, and now I stop. Catch-all number two. That's my new omega. Well, this will have its limits. 
having done the best we can, there will remain part of the catch-all that we cannot characterize positively, the catch-all within the catch-all. Well, we might try to crack that open. We keep iterating and so it goes indefinitely. We have a catch-all within the catch-all, within the catch-all, within the catch-all. We never catch all in the catch-all. So we don't pretend to positively characterize the entire catch-all. But I think things are even worse than, than that for the set theoretic approach. We cannot catch the catch-all at all. I had to practice saying that. Well, let's, what am I talking about? What's the problem? What exactly is the catch-all when we do probability theory with sets? And coming up, this is one of my main punchlines. Well, Alan, it's easy. It's the complement of the set of possibilities that we've identified so far. But hang on, complementation is only defined relative to a universal set. A catch-all is only a complement with respect to a given set of possibilities. But the whole point is that in practice, we don't have omega in the first place. We're constructing it. But let me, let me try and make this vivid. Start with omega. Let's call it omega one, omega two, dot, dot, dot. And then we add the catch-all. Omega one, omega two, dot, 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 catch-all. Okay, really? What is that? Don't just say catch-all, let's spell it out. Oh, well, that's easy, Alan. Remember, it's just the complement. Hang on. Omega is omega one, omega two, dot, 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 big omega minus all of those possibilities that we've enumerated. Wait, that's circular. Whoops. This is not well defined. We never really spelt out what omega is. We defined it in terms of itself. Again, it's an axiom that probability of omega equals one, but what exactly are we attaching probability one to? Now, let me try and illustrate this. And one of my heuristics, by the way, is when you can draw a diagram, pictures are worth a thousand words or maybe even Aleph naught words. All right, we've got a Venn diagram and normally we have, so to speak, sharp edges of our propositions, which we represent as regions on the diagram, like I've diagrammed a proposition P and that's some set of worlds, some set of possibilities on my diagram. And complementation, we normally think of as, as easy. Well, it's just everything outside P. But now, I, I hope you see this. This is a blurry Venn diagram. So P is sharp, but, but I hope you see this sort of swirling, you know, amorphous omega in the background rather than the sharp edge that I had before. Okay, and where's not P? There it is, but hang on, what, what are the limits of not P? Well, it's bounded by omega, but we haven't nailed what omega is. So we haven't nailed complementation. And this isn't just a problem for the catch-all, obviously, this is a problem for complementation in general. What about the sentential version of probability theory? Up to there, I was imagining Kolmogorov's set theoretic uh, version, but we could do it sententially. And you might say, come on, Alan, how could it be so hard to define the catch-all? Just take the disjunction of all the events that you've identified so far and negate that. Now, this may bring out an unappreciated difference between the set theoretic and the sentential formulations a probability theory. People keep saying, oh, they're interchangeable. Do it one way, do it the other way. If you prefer set theory, go for it. If you prefer sentential version, go for it. Well, I'm saying no, it seems to make a difference. 
Negation is easy. It's just a one place operator. Start with sentence S and generate not S. But complementation is more complicated. <laughs> it is a two place operator needing two operands, set S and the universal set with respect to which the complementation is taken. But the whole point is that we don't have the universal set. We're building it. So much for the received view that the set theoretic and sentential formulations of probability theory are equivalent or interchangeable. They can't be because a problem that arises for one doesn't arise for the other. So things seem to be looking more promising for omega, at least for practical purposes. We formulate it sententially and sideways complete it with a catch-all. But still there are problems. And now we're at the very last part of the talk. It may be difficult in practice to assign a probability to the catch-all. Look, we may know that heads and tails are equally likely, but not be sure how much probability to assign to the catch-all. It's an amorphous event that can't be specified. Okay, so I know that heads and tails should be equal in probability, but how much do I leave out over for edge? And how much do I leave for a bird flies away with the coin and so on. Yet when we're forecasting extreme events, the events that constitute the catch-all may especially deserve our attention. You know, extreme pandemics, human ending, humanity ending climate change. Psychological studies show that we tend to underestimate the probability of the catch-all and there's also a problem with assigning expected utility to the catch-all. It should be the probability weighted average of the utilities of various realizations of the catch-all. But to the extent that we nail down realizations of it, they vanish from the catch-all. We haven't nailed them down, the possibilities that remain. Still less have we assigned probabilities and utilities to them. So what happens if the actual outcome lands in the catch-all? We might say the experiment was not performed. Well, that might be fine for artificial cases like coin and die tosses. But what about real life? Something happened. How are we to revise our probabilities if we learn that the actual outcome lands in the catch-all? I mean, just think. Uh, again, of the global financial crisis. Imagine an, an, an economist saying, well, the experiment was just not performed because something that we didn't specify happened. Just imagine trying to say to the agriculture de department when an unforeseen pest enters the country, oh, we just didn't model the experiment. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Don't just say that the experiment was performed. It wasn't, not properly. Or imagine saying, look, I want credit in my model because I, I made space for the catch-all in my model. No, you don't get credit. You didn't see it coming. And you don't know how to revise your probabilities given this thing that was not specifically specified. Okay, we won't settle on just the trivial assignment of one to what was previously the catch-all zero else because you learnt more specific things. We learnt the particular way in which the catch-all is realised. For example, we learnt the global financial crisis was caused by the subprime mortgage crisis in 2007. Okay, we learnt specific things. And we'll form various credences for more specific propositions. For example, the GFC was caused by that mortgage, subprime mortgage crisis. We saw a version of this problem when omega was sideways incomplete. Incompleteness in either direction exposes us to learning things that are not in omega. And we need an account of how we should revise our credences when this happens. And finally, after all this build up, I can complete our omega dilemma. If omega is sideways and downwards complete, then it is a proper class. Remember, I, I showed this uh, many slides ago. 
then orthodox probability theory breaks down and must be rethought. And I consider that to be a big deal. It's not business as usual, the Kolmogorov theory that we know and love and that we were taught in all the textbooks and our probability classes, we, we have to start again. Other horn of the dilemma, if omega is incomplete, either sideways or downwards, then we need an account of how probabilities should be revised when a proposition that is not in omega is learnt. We have to be prepared for black swans, but how do we learn them? All right, well, despite my title, <laughs> this is not the last word on the matter, but I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I, I think now you can turn on the video and uh, if you yep. close the screen sharing thing, maybe that's and, the cause of the yeah. whole thing. Uh, yeah. th uh, that's interesting. See that yeah. this is the first time that I did the screen sharing. Uh, exactly. And pre previously it always worked. And now I think you've nailed it. That's, that's the yeah. problem. That's yeah. why there was an extra burden. So let's. So the, yeah. The, the world is still logical. So we can. It's still explain. logical. <laughs> yes. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, if you turn off the sharing, then we can uh, turn on the video maybe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me try a few things. Yes, here we go. Yeah. Uh, how's that? Good. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And uh -huh. I can even turn my video on. Perhaps let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. Oh, I see. Uh, you you'll you'll do it for me. I think right. Oh, uh, okay. Let me let, let me. Yes. I let's let's start my video. Yes, good. Okay, okay, I, great. I, I have to now yeah. behave myself again. I for a while there, I could just lie down on the bed and <laughs> right, right, right. Now I have to yeah, have thank to you for eat. making the efforts. I mean, yeah. 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 Okay, okay, so maybe I will use my privilege to uh, to first. I have a I have a remark and uh, one question. Then we take yeah. some questions from the audience. Okay, yep. so, so first, I, I really want to say maybe this problem of omega is really um, uh, it matters in practice serious things because I, I, I still remember when I was doing my PhD in the Netherlands, there was a very famous case. I, I'm not sure whether you, you, you know. That. Um, so there was this um, Dutch nurse called uh, Lucia, de, uh, Lucia de Burke, yeah. uh, who, who was working in several nursing homes in the Netherlands uh, to help to give birth to the baby and take care of the baby. But uh, it's very weird. Uh, no matter where she worked, there was also a bunch of baby died for some reason. Mm. <laughs> And then, uh, of course, for many people, it sort of hinted at some possible crime she, uh, well, may do for the babies. Yeah. And um, okay, so so there was th this trial, and the people present uh, some evidence, uh, but there is one very important uh, indirect evidence provided by some Dutch mathematicians to calculate the uh, probability of she, uh, of, uh, so assuming she is innocent, how, uh, so, so, okay, so it, it should be the other way around. So um, what is the probability of her being innocent, but still you got all these um, uh, cases. Yep. And uh, I think, yeah, at the beginning it was calculated like, one in a couple of hundred million. So it's yeah. really tiny um, number. Yeah. So, so yeah. very unlikely that she is innocent. So yes. at the beginning, she was sentenced to life uh, time uh, prison, what do you call it? Yeah, so, so the lifetime yeah. Life imprisonment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But 
I, I think uh, around the, like uh, 2008 or uh, nine, there was uh, another Dutch uh, mathematician, uh, a statistician uh, who, who was arguing that there was something wrong with the calculation. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, yeah I, I think it's uh, part of it is, is uh, designing or, or, or say, uh, uh, defining the right omega for this particular yeah. case because you need to calculate the, the thing. So people did the calculation again, and uh, not only this Dutch mathematician, but also some 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 person from Cambridge. They in the end uh, propose another probability, which is like one out of forty-eight or something, one out of a few hundred. So it's huge okay, not difference. So in the end, that, that attracted a lot of uh, attention in the in in the Netherlands, but not only in the Netherlands but internationally, because of the use of mathematics or especially probability um, estimations in 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 these trials. So in the end, she I think she was freed uh, around uh, oh. like a 2010, because. Yeah, the judge uh, thought it's, I mean, this evidence of uh, 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 the probability uh, estimation is not so great. So, uh, and yeah. there, there was no uh, direct evidence that she really did uh, those things. I, I think that that's really a, um, a striking yeah. example that uh, it matters. I mean, the, of course, right, there right, are right. several issues, not only the, the the omega, but also the uh, the the way of calculating this conditional probability. Yeah, so so this is just my remark. Actually, uh, there, there is also a nice movie out of this. I think it's it's just called Lucia the Bee. Yeah, also for the audience, if you like to watch it, it it's it's good movie. I mean, uh, you can imagine there are a lot of these <laughs> things going on. Uh, uh, yeah. in the movie and uh, it shows, I mean, it, it, it's a nice movie. Also, it's related yeah. to my institute where I did my PhD. MCWI is one of the uh, kind of funding institute for the Dutch uh, probability theory yeah. uh, research. Uh, oh. So some professors in our institute are also involved in the whole discussion. And it's, it, it was very interesting. Okay, so, so yeah. much for this rather long yeah. remark, but uh, I, I do have a, a say, uh, rather uh, slightly technical question. So um, I think similar issues also happen, as I said, say in epistemic modeling. So what kind of um, model uh, in terms of uh, epistemic possibility we should include to solve or model one situation. But there is, uh, at least in the epistemic modeling, um, I mean, the question you want to solve by this modeling is very important. And usually we can write it down by certain uh, formulas in some logical language. And then if you can specify, so what kind of uh, uh, possible result you want to verify or argue, then you can use the information in this uh, formula, I mean, the, the thing you want to discuss by this model to sort of give some constraints or some ideas about the, uh, the model. In, in in a technical sense. Uh, for example, um, in for example, in, in model logic, uh, there is this notion called uh, uh, by simulation contraction. So by simulation is sort of uh, like isomorphism between uh, creepy key structures. Uh, and um, there is this notion that you, you can compress the creepy key structure by using this kind of uh, structural equivalence uh, uh, relation uh, with respect to certain, uh, say, atomic propositions you want to use to discuss your result. So if you fix uh, a, a finite set of uh, propositions that will be discussed in your result that you want to model, then you can use this information to say, okay, so although I, I don't know so much about what kind of probability uh, possibilities I, I, I should include in this model, but I can prove to some extent that this kind of model and a more detailed model, they are sort of equivalent modulo the question I want to answer technically. 
so so I'm wondering whether this kind of uh, things uh, are there in probability uh, spaces, like uh, some kind of um, abstraction uh, equivalence notion to connect different, uh, say, uh, sample spaces or prob probability uh, spaces uh, together, uh, given a sort of, uh, say, conditional probability you really want to calculate. Uh, so that that's the the question. So whether you have also this kind of uh, things uh, such that you can argue so the details only matters to some uh, limit uh, because I have certain uh, goal uh, by using this kind of uh, probability uh, model to 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 discuss. So um, yeah, that that's the good the question. Thank you. I, I have several yeah. things to say about that. That's, that's okay. a good question. Thank you. All right, so I guess you could imagine two probability spaces are, as we might say, isomorphic yeah, with respect more, to yeah. the, the issue that you're concerned with, yeah, the yeah. question that you're trying to answer, for yeah. example. That's right. And so I, I worried at various points in my talk about, gee, well, you know, you, do we choose this space or this other one? And, and I, I think the point of your question is sometimes you may not need to worry so much about it because yeah, that, that's any... Any of these representatives would serve your purposes yeah, yeah, just yeah. as well. Uh, uh -huh. The details only matter uh, mm -hmm. up to a point. Maybe yet another way of putting the same point, uh, put it in terms of supervaluating, namely uh, uh, yeah. here, here are sort of various candidate, let's call them precisifications, you know, mm -hmm. specific versions of omega that sort mm -hmm. of are permissible as far as our question at hand is concerned, yeah. okay? And then we might ask what's, what's true on all of them? And then that's just true and we can, we can go to sleep happily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we, like we've, yeah we've yeah. completely solved that problem. And then if something is super false, it's true on none of them, then mm -hmm. it's just definitely false and yes. we don't have yes. to think about it again. And then the interesting case is if it's mm -hmm. something in between where some of the candidate probability spaces give one answer but not all of them do there's some disagreement among them and now i guess we we could say it's indeterminate what the answer to that question is for example yeah so i, I definitely get get your point and I, I think it's a good issue and i it would be nice to look more into what would count for specific problems as, yeah, as yeah, isomorphisms yeah. and su super you know valuations and precisifications of that kind so that's yeah, good yeah, yeah. yes Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, so uh, well, before Liu Yang asks the question, let's take one from the audience. Uh, so you can also see it, uh, uh, Alan. Uh, so it's in Q and A from uh, one of our students, uh, okay. Kun. Um, okay. So right now, I see no open questions. Uh, no, something? in the answered one. So if you click answered. Uh huh. Yeah, so yeah, I will read it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, Professor Hayek, could you make comments on the relation between measure theory in real number and possibility? Uh, to be more specific, the law of large number of central limits theorem, though omega is not complete, we have the intuition that they are true almost everywhere. <laughs> you, have, you have hit upon uh, several of my favorite topics. Uh, I have recently written a paper on uh, non-measurable sets. Mm -hmm. uh, this was with John Hawthorne and Joav Isaacs. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've been thinking a bit about measure theory. And I've also fairly recently written a paper that involves the laws of large numbers. Uh, actually, <laughs> here's a fun little case. Remember my, my heuristic for the word yeah. the? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. see the law of large number, and it's often said that way. So I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, uh, trying to give you a hard time. Uh, but actually, there are there's more than one law of, of large numbers. There's there's the strong law and the weak law, and and they have different uh, convergence properties. Or the central limit theorem. That's right. Uh, and actually, there are even versions of, of that. Uh, though omega is not complete, we have the intuition that they are true almost everywhere. So I, I, I take it what you're saying here is that these convergence theorems, like the laws of large numbers, 
like the central limit theorem, they are not guarantees. They do not have the form such and such convergence necessarily happens. No, they're probabilistically qualified. They say this convergence happens with probability one or this, this sequence will converge uh, you know, to, to, to something with the probabilities converging to one. And I, so I think actually that you're, you're hitting on a very important point here that again, to even state these theorems, you need a probability space, which begins with omega, okay? And all of these theorems have to be relativized to that space, okay? Probability one, namely, uh, in this space of omega fp. Uh, I guess, you, you know how I made the distinction between toy examples and sort of real life examples? The laws of large number cases, they're, they're always these toy examples like, you know, coin tossing or, you know, uh, in the central limit theorem, you've got IID random variables and, and so on. So you, you have a sort of good handle on things. Uh, it's rather harder to <laughs> apply the laws of large numbers in real life. And by the way, people keep doing it and it really annoys me. Uh, they'll, you, we ask something like, why is it that the, when you look at a, at a sequence of coin tosses, say a hundred tosses, why is it that we typically see roughly 50, 50 heads tails? We normally see close to 50 heads, close to 50 tails. And then people say, oh, it's because of the law of large numbers. No, 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 it's got nothing to do with the law of large numbers for a start because <laughs> the number's not large, it's only 100, 50, 50. Uh, what it has to do with is something else, the binomial uh, theorem, uh, binomial distribution and just properties of that. Uh, so, so maybe I'm throwing that in to also show how these convergence results sort of interact with the questions that I raised at different points some theoretical, purely theoretical, and some practical. And so uh, it's, it's rather hard to, to get the, these theorems to apply to the practical cases. Uh, let me give you one more example. Uh, why is it that in real life, we see so many normal distributions? You know, why is it that height or IQ or weight or you know, blah, 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 so many different variables follow a normal distribution? And then people keep saying, oh, it's because of the central limit theorem. And I keep replying, no, <laughs> it's not because of that. Okay. Again, it might be because of uh, something, so to speak, intermediate. Like maybe really what you have is a binomial distribution. And then mm -hmm. for suitable values of the parameters, the binomial distribution looks a lot like a normal distribution, like the binomial hundred half distribution kind of looks normal-ish and it gets better and better as, as n increases, okay? But that's the true explanation. It's not the conver convergence result. Okay, so I feel like I've, I've said lots of things, partly because you got me so excited that you, you happen to hit three different uh, topics that I've written about uh, recently. Uh, and I think in that sense, I have answered the question. I, namely, I did make some comments on the relation, well, between measure theory, maybe I didn't say much about that, measure theory in real number and possibility. Well, look, probability theory is itself measure theory, right? It's a probability is a special case of a measure. It's the normalized measure. Uh, and that's what singles it out from other measures like volume and mass and so on, which, which are not so normalized. Uh, so whatever I say about probability theory just carries over here to, to measure theory. Actually, I think you're, maybe you're raising another interesting question. Measure theory is not just the theory of probability. And so these issues of omega that I've, I've been raising, they extend beyond probability theory to wherever measure theory is applied. For example, measure theory is applied to space, you know, like the, the, the sets of, you know, Euclidean space or, 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 or other spaces. Uh, 
maybe in that case, it's fairly easy to, to demarcate the, the set of possibilities, but it could be used in other cases where it's much harder. So, okay, that, I, I should stop, but thank you that you got me thinking about 10 different things at the same time. Oh, uh, oh I, I see the Kun uh, turn on the video. Uh, do you want to s ask a follow-up question, the Kun? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, no, okay. Uh, <laughs> You're satisfied you. with All right. Professor yeah. Ajax. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you for your question. So now let's ask Liu Yang. It's my turn now. Hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. again. Nice to see you again. Hey, nice to see you again, Alan. Yay. And uh, okay, I might sound a little bit disoriented because it's still early for me here in England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we know that, you know, an idealized or classical Bayesian probability theory and it starts with um, a big prior and by which I mean, also it's a triple, as you mentioned, there's omega, there's uh, algebra, there's a probability equipped on the algebra. Yeah. And then the idealization is that um, we just, scientists just keep, you know, doing the conditionalization. So they try to use this model as a model for scientific investigation. We just yep. keep doing the uh, conditionalization when the evidence comes in and the hope is to convert to truth somehow. So we got, uh, you know, sequence of posterians. And uh, so, but as you said, and uh, that's not how scientists do science on planet earth, right? So, <laughs> so scientists, you know, they do, they're, for me, I think they're perfect you know, uh, a very skillful uh, pragmatist, they would just say, whoops, that's not the prior I should be working with. Then they jumped, they just jumped to a different prior and to carry on. Yep. So they don't worry about this jump from a previous prior to a new prior. Yes. It is us, the philosophers, yep. we're so used to the idea that when, when you're engaged in the intellectual investigation, any jump of the stage of knowledge should be justified. And that's why we're so worried about you know, the jumping from prior one to prior two, right? Yeah, good. Because uh, so forth with the, you know, the recent reverse Bayesianism and the, the an all, all collective set, you, sorry, all inclusive sets and mentioned in your talk and so, 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 uh, <clears throat> and so on. So I was just wondering, why don't we as philosophers can devise some kind of a whoopsism and, <laughs> you know, just a sheer practicalism and uh, to let it go instead of trying to find one principle after another principle, trying to justify the jump from one prior to yep. another. Sorry for this, a very, you know, cynical I, I, um, question because I, 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 I myself, I'm also working on the similar project, you know, and in response to the re recent literature on reverse Bayesianism, yeah. Yeah, which I've been getting into as well, yeah. Uh-huh, cool. Uh, should I jump in now? Is it now the good time? Yep, all right. Oh, so yeah, I, I, okay, so as, as I distinguished in the talk itself, let's distinguish these two different projects. You might call them normative and descriptive, but actually I think that's even too to course, uh, we have philosophers for some reason really fixate on this idealized agent. And, um, and boy, this agent is really idealized, you know, logically omniscient, right? Indefinite computational power, right? Uh, yeah, but that's, that, there's a double standard. So you're deductively in the unlimited. But yeah. somehow epistemically you're not, so you're still uncertain about what's going on, but um, you are mathematically or logically omniscient. Yeah. That's a great point. In fact, let me, let me add to that, uh, how, how sort of selective the idealization is. I can think of all sorts of idealizations. Here, here's another one, you know, God. God is just omniscient about everything and, and assigns probability yeah. one. <laughs> Well, that's an idealization. I, I, maybe I want to run with that. Uh, I, I could imagine also the reverse idealization from what's what's standard, namely uh, someone who who is extremely sort of empirically ideal. You know, have fantastic sensory apparatus, mm. but they're just they're not so good at logic, 
that, that's yeah. a kind yes. of idea. Maybe we're talking about the Greek gods. So the Greek they're gods. imperfect. <laughs> they're <laughs> imperfect in some yeah. respect. Yeah, that's it. So there's so many different idealizations. First point. Uh, and then we, you know, flesh and blood human beings, we don't obey any of these things. You know, we're 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 empirically sub sub you know ideal, and we're uh, logically sub ideal, and and we're uncertain and all of that. Okay, and and now, so what are we supposed to do with all of that? So, for a start, I think it's a somewhat contingent thing that philosophers have latched onto this particular idealization, the the one we you you've been talking about. You know, deductively perfect, and somehow empirically imperfect. And it should be interesting to trace, like, how did that happen? Why? How did that become? You Columbia guys, you, you, you often know the history of <laughs> probability better than I do. And uh, uh, Oh, sorry. It, <laughs> that's okay. cute. It, it would be interesting to see how, well, how this became the paradigm. Uh, but, but anyway, still, I think what I would like is to have multiple sort of different idealizations and each of them could be illuminating in its own way. And we could approximate the ideal in different respects. And so, you know, let, let a, a number of models bloom uh, simultaneously, but, but that's, that's not how it goes. And in fact, think, let's just go in a bit more detail in the Bayesian case. Uh, th this must've driven Isaac crazy. So you, you had the, uh, the perfect Bayesian ideal, but then Dick Jeffrey came along and said, well, but maybe this agent isn't so good after all at, you know, figuring out exactly what its, its evidence was. It doesn't give, you know, certainty to some evidence proposition. And so now this agent spreads probabilities across a partition and Jeffrey conditionalizes. Well, there's another idealization, I guess. Uh, and why is that the right one. Now, David Lewis once told me, he never said this in print, he never published this, but he said, uh, in fact, I'll even do the impersonation with the beard and everything. He said, uh, wanting to be like Jesus doesn't mean that you should try to walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so the, the point was he was making, I guess, is, uh, we should not necessarily strive for the ideals embodied in, let it be in this case, perfect Bayesianism or something, right? Yeah. Uh, we, you know, scientists, humans uh, should not try to walk on water. We should not try to follow exactly these norms. Yeah. And this gets us into a whole big topic of what, what's the point of idealization? Uh, Lyle Zinder, for example, has written a paper about this roughly 20 years ago, about idealizations are normative even for actual people because they impose an ordering. And uh, we, what we should strive to do is get as high up the ordering as we can, you know, yeah. namely as high as ideal, as close to ideal as you as we can. Yeah, it's a very interesting paper. It's a good paper. I'm not sure I agree, though. I, th I think you can have the ordering without the ideal at all. But anyway, so but, I, I think, yeah, the, the choice of idealization is really, I, I would say, personal. It's and also depends on your sometimes the educational kind of a background. So it's uh, in, in one paper I recently wrote, I, 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 I said this is a basically a sociological kind of uh, problem that um, you choose this to idealize him, but another person and do differently. Yeah, talking about Isaac and uh, exactly. I picked bone with him. We picked a bone with him for years about this, uh, you know, kind of accountability, uh, kind of versus uh, <clears throat> finite accountability uh, issue. And uh, he insists, for instance, that as the algebra, you need the set of all sets of omega as your algebra. Yeah, and that's perfect, a yeah. crazy idea, you know. So we've been fighting this for years, and uh, well. Oh, I, Isaac would have would have hated my my recent paper. <laughs> I mean, what about non-measurable sets? That's isn't that a problem? Yeah, that's us? I. So in a recent paper, I wrote on this. I said it's 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 unthinkable to 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 include 
unmeasurable sets in a decision theoretical kind of a context, right? In set theory, it's perfect because you have you have a different and uh, an axioms to choose from. But in that context, uh, those axioms has meaning, right? But uh, yeah. in the decision theoretical context, and it, right. it makes quite less sense to even talk about, you know, the choice of a large cardinals, for instance, you know, if we have an inaccessible cardinal, you can consider this kind of a unmeasurable set, but if you, you choose a different large cardinal and you can't. So, so yeah. that's, I, 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 yeah. So I, I can send you that paper and, uh, sure. and please send me your paper. Sure, sure, can, can, yeah. do, can do that. I feel, okay. I feel so, like my, so, my cat is scratching on the door. Let's see if she wants to be part of this show. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, she doesn't want to come. Never mind. I, if, if, if Yang can bring, bring his cat, so can I. But... Oh, right. Okay, so I think yep. Adam has a, a question. So Adam, please. Go, go for it. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you guys for Hi. letting me attend again. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a question about the dilemma at the end. So... Um, I uh, I wonder if you have a view about which horn it's better to grasp. Um, and I also wanted to ask that if we grasp the horn where we allowed omega to be incomplete, um, do you think we can maintain, in light of that, ideas about rational ways of updating on evidence you had no previous conception of, you know, when, when you acquire evidence yeah, you had yeah. no previous conception of? Yeah, cheers. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah good question. I, I, I certainly get it. Well, which which horn I, I well I certainly don't have the mathematical chops to to make any progress on the first horn uh you know the proper class probability theory that that is beyond my pay grade uh but but maybe maybe I want to grasp horn two anyway and say that's the way I'd rather uh I think that's the better horn to to, to be on it's a, namely somehow I make my peace with omega being incomplete and then that I think feeds into the second part of your question. So then can I say something sensible about uh, updating w when you learn of a black swan, when you, when you get hit with a surprise? Uh, no, let's, let's think. So normally updating is thought of as a sort of conservative operation that you stay as close as you can to your previous probability function and then you sort of minimally mutilate it. You move somehow to the closest function. So I guess the first step would be to try to, to come up with a, a kind of distance between probability functions on different spaces, your original space and the enlarged space, uh, and then move to the closest one in the enlarged space. And so, so that's the form of the solution. And I, I would have to think much harder about how do you realize that? What, what would that even mean to to have a distance measure on these disparate omegas. But, but that's how I would start. I feel, like, I feel like people out there must be thinking about this. Do, do any of you out there know about this? Well, uh, one of you mentioned reverse Bayesianism. Who, who said that? Was it Yang? Some, someone um, mentioned reverse uh, Bayesianism. I, I think that that was Yang. Yeah, uh, no. he's 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 gone for a moment. That's okay. Uh, he's playing with his cat. He's playing with his cat. Fair enough too. Fair enough yeah. too. I would if I could with mine. Uh, uh, but anyway, that, that seems like a hard problem, and th this will be very much part of this big project of mine about you know forecasting extreme events and so on and. You, you just heard the very first installment, the Omega, you know, very early version of that. But but that's a it's a good question for that project. Okay, well, you're hit with a black swan. You have to enlarge your Omega suddenly. Yeah. How do you revise? Yeah. So I've, I've had some tentative answers to that just now. Yeah. Thank this you. is also, uh, well, in epistemic logic, is this is also a serious issue and how to enlarge your Kind of epistemic uh, possibilities. If you you were not aware of some possibilities, but some new information comes in, and you you have to 
enlarge your say uh, uh, model and uh, it, it's much easier to to shrink your model we're doing yeah. all kinds of relativization right. of your model but it's it's hard to to imagine how would you do a enlargement um especially right. in terms right. of uh, multi-agent setting so yep. you, when you add one possible word into your epistemic model then everything changes so you, you need a way to control what you are adding i mean yeah yeah hey, i should not just possible yeah yeah I should put in a plug. I, I, I feel guilty I'm not giving a better answer, Aidan, to your question because my colleague Katie Steele and, mm -hmm. and Ori Stefansson have uh, just written a manuscript. It's not completely finished, but it's, it's close on what they call growing awareness. Oh, and okay. and, and that, that's basically this problem of, of yeah. you know, increasing yeah. omega. And then, so, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think I was sort of, channeling their view that you do still want to stay conservative in this way. Uh, right. And yeah. Yang, now, now that you're back, do you know something about reverse Bayesianism? Because that I think that's relevant here. Yeah, so basically they criticize reverse Bayesianism. So, so reverse Bayesianism is, uh, you know, invented by, uh, it, uh, by economists. So they're trying to talk about, you know, how when you shift the probability and some part is preserved, some part of the condition is preserved. So basically they're saying that you're now adding new hypothesis into your omega, yeah. but uh, then you need to dis redistribute your probability. But some, prob pro uh, sorry, some property need to be preserved. That is the, yeah. the ratio. So yeah. the addition of new hypothesis, if this new hypothesis is not e affecting in some way of some um, other hypothesis, then the probability ratio should be preserved, but yep. this has a lot of problems. Yep. And I yep. think, um, I Here's think, what I found. sorry, I think <clears throat> Katie's paper and uh, and Ori's paper is already published. Uh, in, I think it's mine. in mine. Mine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That that's right. So that so I'll send you there as well, Aiden. And uh, that's mm -hmm. so that's. And, and I, th I th they must have a positive view as well. So they point out the problems with reverse. Bayesianism, uh, and I think they do have have a positive view of, of how they should what it should be replaced by too. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, uh, maybe we can say uh, call it a day, or at least I, I, uh, I actually have uh, to. I'm, soon I have another Zoom meeting, so. <laughs> Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, so no. In, it's good. We're not there yet. But it, that. Oh, but okay, it's, okay. So big day today. Uh, I'm okay, already. So. I already started another Zoom meeting on site. <laughs> yeah, look at us. This is life these days. This is how we roll. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, life it's a, a, AI yeah. in Chinese uh, science fiction. <laughs>